Welcome to OmniFocus uh, Workflows with Fraser Spear, and thanks to everyone who's joining here live. Uh, we've got a very international group as usual, people from uh, Canada and the States and, and Spain and uh, Germany and United Kingdom. Uh, so you're, you're very welcome, and if you're watching a recording of this, um, uh, you're very welcome as well, and hope uh, you'll come to join us on one of the, the live sessions. So if you're new to uh, Learn OmniFocus, this is a uh, site that I launched in uh, June of 2014. It was just after the new OmniFocus 2 for Mac came out. And I'd done OmniFocus consulting for years, working with people all over the world, and realized uh, that there was no way I was going to possibly be able to, to work with, with everyone who was wanting some, some help uh, really using this tool effectively. And I also really wanted to create a community around uh, OmniFocus, and it's got such a a rich uh, community of people who use this app. So I create, launched this site and it uh, continues to, to grow. Um, as I mentioned, uh, just before we started the recording, uh, currently people from over 60 countries have joined and number continues to go up and it's been really great to continuing to, to get to know people within the community. So before we get to our, uh, our feature act for today, I just want to give a little peek uh, of some of the things that are coming up. Uh, there's lots of exciting plans for 2017. And one of those is the next webinar, which is called Practical Focus with OmniFocus. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have in this day and age is uh, staying focused when there's so much grabbing at our attention. There's so much uh, pulling us away from from maybe the work that we're, we're meant to be doing. So this webinar is really gonna dive into, first of all, why focus is a good idea, why it's a really key skill to develop as part of being highly productive and how we can use OmniFocus to help to maintain that focus. And also we'll look at some, some third-party apps that um, really help to create a, a nice uh, focused environment. And these are ones that I, use uh, pretty much daily. And we'll look at some ways of kind of measuring, getting some metrics on how you're doing on the focus front. That'll be taking place on Thursday, January 12th, 2017. That'll be from noon to 1 p.m. Pacific time. And hopefully that'll accommodate uh, people wherever you happen to be. And if you do uh, find you'd like to join these webinars and the time just doesn't quite fit, uh, definitely let me know and I'm happy to, uh, to look at doing them at other times as well. I just want to briefly uh, mention as well this uh, holistic productivity site I'm going to be launching very soon. And I've been teaching courses around holistic productivity since um, 2009. I gave a talk um, called Holistic Productivity at the OmniFocus Setup event back in 2013. And I decided it was time uh, that it had its own, own home on the web. So this, uh, this is a site that'll be launching uh, before the end of the year, and I'm really excited to, to bring this to fruition. And uh, the, just like on Learn OmniFocus, there'll be a lot of opportunity to connect with people in community and a video conferenced environment as we have today. Um, and it'll be a really nice uh, compliment to Learn OmniFocus. So Omni, Learn OmniFocus will continue to, to deal with spring things specific to OmniFocus, and then this will will take a, a broader look at productivity in its many different facets. So if you want to uh, stay in the loop on that, uh, if you go to holisticproductivity.net and there's a uh, mailing list sign up. Okay, well, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Fraser Spears, who's somebody I've been following for for, for many years and uh, somebody whose work I definitely great, greatly admire. I could probably spend the rest of the, uh, the session talking about all of the, the things he's accomplished, but I uh, want to make sure he has a chance to speak very soon, so I'll just highlight a, a few of the top ones. Uh, he's probably best known for, um, for the work that he's done at his school, the C Cedar School of Excellence. And uh, this is where the very first one-to-one -one, um, iPad program was launched, where st each student has their own iPad. And uh, so Fraser's been uh, using iPads since the very beginning, and not just using them personally, but using them in a classroom setting. He's definitely gained a lot of wisdom in that area. Um, he uh, takes some of that wisdom and provides consulting to, to people all over the world. And uh, you can go to FraserSpears.com to, to learn more about that. Uh, he's also been uh, recently been a part of a um, fundraising project. Yeah, it's basically to uh, to give, and maybe Fraser can briefly mention this just so I don't uh, misrepresent it, but to take uh, uh, deliver iPads to India where they're being uh, used by women as part of a solar project. And hopefully, I more or less got that right, Fraser. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, they're still in transit at the moment because of the Samsung fiasco. Uh, so they're they're not allowed to go on a plane anymore. So it's taking a little bit longer to get them there than we'd hoped, but. 
uh, that's that project is is done now and was very successful. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and, and definitely kudos for for taking that on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Fraser is also a, an avid podcaster, so he's been doing the Out of School podcast with Bradley Chambers for for many years, and more recently um, he started a Canvas pro- a podcast with Federico Vitici, who's probably best known for Mac Stories. And um, and Fraser and Federico are both uh, avid iPad users, and I definitely recommend checking this one out. Um, I can't think of a better place to go if you really want to be super productive on your, your iPad, and this is one I listen to religiously. Well, Tim, thanks for having me on, on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, now that you've actually spelled out all the things that I do, I'm actually starting to feel a little overwhelmed by my own workflow now. <laughs> um, to, to give people a little bit of introduction to me and, and what I do, um, you've seen the kind of headline items that I'm, my day job is I'm a teacher. Uh, my exact title is I'm the head of the secondary department at Cedar School. I started there as a computer science teacher and have slowly gained more and more and more responsibilities, some of which go up the way and some of which go down the way. So uh, I like to say that I do everything from cutting the ethernet cables all the way up to doing the policy. And uh, that's genuinely true. Anything that plugs in somehow becomes my problem as well. So uh, that's fine. I also have uh, two podcasts that we do. Uh, Once uh, Out of School comes out once a week and Canvas comes out once a fortnight. And various consulting things, uh, working on a number of other projects, some of which are, are people who are interested in the iPad may also be interested to know that we are also one of the first schools who have adopted Swift Playgrounds for iPad as well. So this is Apple's new um, coding program on iPad, and we're using that in school now as well. So I'm one of the first teachers to, to roll that out as well. So that's something else that's kind of uh, part of my front of mind projects at the moment. Uh, in, in terms of my kind of history with OmniFocus, I, I've been an OmniFocus user since 1.0, in fact, before 1.0. Uh, in the days before OmniFocus existed, one of the things that some people who are kind of old hands on OmniFocus might know is uh, Kinkless GTD, which was a, a set of Apple scripts that worked with Omni Outliner back in the day to implement a basic version of GTD. And back in those days, I had also been doing some work on Apple scripts and getting things done and uh, on the outline at the same time. So I was, I was kind of working in that area and, and trying to build some things uh, for my own use back then as well. And very happy to kind of throw all that away when OmniFocus came out uh, in, in 1.0 and have more or less continued with it since then. There have been times where I, I've tried other systems. I've tried um, Evernote for a while. I, I certainly looked at other task management systems, but always have found that I come back to OmniFocus and I, I've been uh, solidly back on OmniFocus since, I suspect probably since 2.0 shipped. Um, I haven't really, I, I decided eventually you come to a point in your life where um, this is, you realize the futility of constant change and, and you say, well, OmniFocus might not be perfect. It might not be, it may not have every feature you want, but it is the thing for me and it's, it's my home for tasks. So I've kind of settled down with OmniFocus and I think that's probably us for good now. I certainly hope so. Um, the other thing that is kind of relevant is, is to discuss a little bit about my kind of computing setup because uh, that drives the reason why I'm sharing an iPad screen here straight away rather than uh, some of your previous webinars. People have started with their Mac set up and then showing how they take it mobile. I have been almost a year now all in on iPad Pro. So a year ago, last December, I sold my personal MacBook Pro and went all in with the 12.9 inch iPad Pro. So my my regular work setup or, or my entire life setup really is 12.9 inch iPad Pro, uh, keyboard, pencil, going along with that, and an iPhone 7 Plus. Uh, and that's, that's my existing setup. I do have access to a Mac. I have a very old iMac at home. Uh, I think it's a 2008 iMac, so it is. It, <laughs> you have to warm it up before you can actually start it up. Um, and uh, I have a, access to a Mac Pro at school, which is also our, our print server for iPads in school. So uh, it just so happens that that used to be our server that ran the whole system. And since the school went one-to-one iPad, we don't really have a need for that kind of um, serious server job anymore. So I just use that computer as my desktop if I need to. Um, but I often say to people that I use Macs the kind of way that I use printers is when there's absolutely no alternative. Um, Cause you know, 
I don't know about you, but many people don't sort of have a printer at home anymore. They don't really need a printer day to day the way we used to, um, but we do need it on occasion. And that's kind of the role that the Mac plays in my life now. I was just saying to some people before we started that, uh, for example, one of the things that I would maybe fall back to the Mac for is this week it's report card week at school. And we do that all in Google Docs. And then I have to print out 30, 40, 50 individual Google Doc files. And doing that on the Mac is a fairly straightforward and quick thing. Doing it on iOS is perfectly possible, and I've certainly done it. I've stood there beside the printer with my phone in hand and clicked print 30, 40 times. But this is one of the areas that I've discovered um, where iOS really does still struggle quite a lot is in bulk operations or repeated operations. And we'll look at some things in, in workflow that can maybe help with that a little bit. But even so, uh, things like that still remain quite slow and quite difficult. So uh, that's... I'm not I'm not killing myself just to only ever use iOS and where it makes sense to use Mac, I'll still use it. But in terms of having to every day personally like use a Mac for the things I do day, day to day, for me that world's kind of over and it's iOS is the main machine and the Mac is the one that comes in for the, the odd use case rather than many people who sort of work the other way around where they do most of the work on their Mac and they do a little bit on iOS whenever they whenever they can or have to or they're traveling so light that they can't take the Mac with them or something like that. So that's kind of how, how I look at the, the computer world now is that iOS is the primary operating system and the Mac is, is the kind of the dumper truck, if you like, that you get if you have a big heavy job that you need to do. One of the things that has really, uh, really enabled that transition has been um, wholesale move to cloud storage. And that's been something that has really, really helped. Uh, and it's whenever people ask me, well, how do I get onto the iPad lifestyle? One of the first things I say is, well, you need to think about adopting cloud storage. Now, I'm not religious about which cloud storage provider it is. All of them are very good now. I think we, I personally use Google Drive. And the reason being because I have Google Drive at school and for education, Google very generously give an unlimited amount of data storage. So uh, I have really pushed that to the limit and I can prove that their, their commitment is as good as they say. Uh, and I have more than a terabyte of files in my school Google Drive now. And that enables me to have you know, small devices, 128 gig devices. I have way more data than I could ever download anymore. There's no way I'm getting that back onto any device that I own. Um, so I don't know what will happen if, if Google Drive ever goes away, but well, I might have to go and buy a Mac just to survive that transition. Um, so I'm of course happy to take any questions on you know, iOS lifestyle or things like that as well. Um, but to kind of bring it back to OmniFocus a little bit, one of the things to say is that my my entire OmniFocus life is based on iOS and managed through iOS. And there are still one or two things that you can't do on iOS version of OmniFocus that you can do in the Mac version. And you, you'll maybe notice as we go through that I don't tend to do very many of those things. For example, using subgroups inside a project is a tricky thing to set up on iOS. Um, but for the most part, and I think this is one of the one of the other reasons why the transition to an iOS lifestyle has been possible is because developers like Omni are doing a great job of really making their iOS versions full peers of the Mac version. And in some cases, one of the ones we'll talk about today, automation, uh, almost better than, than the Mac version. Because I was trying to do something on my Mac this morning and I thought, actually, this would be a lot easier if I had workflow in iOS here than, than to try and figure out how to do this on the Mac. So, so that's kind of an in interesting point that I've got too, is that I'm now thinking kind of natively in iOS structures and iOS apps rather than trying to translate a Mac workflow onto iOS because so many of the things that I'm doing now are projects and structures that I've set up since I've transitioned to iOS which means that they don't really have an equivalent on the Mac anymore, and that's not a requirement for me anymore that I have the same thing on the Mac and on iOS. If it's on iOS, that's fine, and I don't really care if I've got it on the Mac or not. So that's kind of my my background and my, my story in terms of uh, introduction and just giving you a mental picture of kind of what I do and, and where I do it. So let me open up OmniFocus and just let you see what it looks like in here. And this is my usual... Uh, my usual set of perspectives. It's OmniFocus with the Pro uh, in-app purchase. And this is the uh, iPad version that I'm sharing with you here. And this has been, this setup has been the kind of, uh, the result of a lot of refinement and work, really. Um, it's not, I would say it's, it may appear quite simplistic, and in some ways it probably is, 
but uh, I guess it's always just about what works for you. And what I find is that uh, the more I complicate it, the less I do it. And that's been something that has sort of been a consistent piece of learning for me over the years. In terms of my, my own GTD practice, I've actually been doing GTD for about 14 years now. Uh, and I only feel like now I'm just about halfway good at doing it. Uh, so it's been a process of, you know, David Allen calls it a martial art for a reason because that's another sort of lifelong practice and skill. And I think uh, GTD definitely falls into that category as well. I'm also going to... Uh, preface what I say here by apologizing to any of your possible previous contributors whose ideas I have stolen uh, and I'm not going to credit them because I can't remember who it was that I got it from but I'm pretty sure you're going to see some things in here that I stole from previous versions of uh, of these webinars so uh, if, if that's anybody there I apologize. Um, one is, just to give you an idea, maybe before, if I go into my calendar before I look at OmniFocus just to start there, this is something, a technique I've been using recently where um, in the morning when I go to school, obviously when you're a teacher, your day is highly structured uh, and you don't really have a lot of either free time or a lot, of, a lot of discretion in how you use that time. And it's quite interesting for me as a teacher to look at GCD, which is in some ways designed to help people who do have a lot of discretion over their free time and a lot of uh, optionality as to what work they do when to make good decisions about that. And in, for me, in some ways, that's been part of OmniFocus or the part of GTD that hasn't really been um, super relevant, which has been the part where David Allen talks about how do you decide what to do next? Uh, and what I'm trying to do here is bring a little bit more of that thinking in because uh, it's very easy for teachers. And if you and if you know teachers, you know they love to complain about not having enough time to do anything. And that's sometimes true. But um, what I've done is that I've got this, this is one a particular calendar that I use called Free Blocks. And what it is, is it's just all the free time that I have between getting to school at 7.30 in the morning and leaving at five. And what I kind of discovered when I did this was that I actually do have quite a lot of time. And if I just used it a little bit more efficiently, I would get a whole lot more done. So what I have here is I just have a, a number of blocks. Some of them are, are named for specific things that I do. Like every Wednesday, um, I have childcare responsibilities after school on Wednesday, so I can't get anything done after school. So I just make sure that on a Wednesday, I, I prepare for Thursday before I, I go on with anything else. Um, and then I have my Friday planning session blocked in there as well. And that actually, the Friday planning one actually refers to a specific uh, perspective and OmniFocus that I'll use to help with that as well. And then more or less, those blocks are just there to be allocated to as time goes on. So if I, if I take you first into my, uh, my rituals uh, perspective, and you, you may recognize some of this stuff, but I've customized it a little bit for the life of a teacher. Um, and I have in here, essentially, the, the perspective setup is just um, uh, focusing on a folder I have called GCD Maintenance, which includes a number of different projects that I use. Um, and I think some of these might be Joe Bulig stuff, I'm not certain. And certainly, I think maybe um, some of the stuff at the bottom belongs to Sean Blanc as well. So uh, I'll... I'm going to be unfairly credit them from poor memory. But basically what the, what the morning looks like for me is I'll come into school, I'll do this, I do this daily review before school starts. So it just prompts me to process a number of things. And in particular, one of the things I've added is, is processing iTunes U because we use iTunes U a lot at school, which is Apple's kind of learning management uh, system. And for example, what I'll do there is students will send me, um, it's like another inbox essentially for teachers. So it's another place that you want to have as part of your uh, clearing ritual, if you like. So if I've got any work to mark in iTunes, it will show up there. Or if students have sent me any messages in there, that will show up there too. And that's just a reminder to look at that as well. I try to process my OmniFocus inbox every day. I don't always get to it, but... Um, I like to have you know maybe less than five or ten things floating about in there. Sometimes if I know it's something that I'm just going to get done pretty quickly that morning, I'm just waiting for somebody else to arrive at school. I'm not bothered turning it into a project or anything like that. Uh, one of the, the learnings that I have had over the years is that physical entries are really, really useful. And I used to kind of dismiss them as being an artifact of the old world, but unfortunately the old world is still sending me paper mail, so I have to accommodate it some way. Um, and having a physical entry both at school and at home has really, really helped with that and just 
r rigorously doing that with, with paper has helped keep that under control quite a lot. Um, so I, I go through, you know, uh, processing the entry email on the focus and iTunes U. Those are kind of my four inboxes for the morning. And then perspectives. Um, I don't actually have a perspective called waiting for, but this is to remind me that one day I'm going to set one up. Um, I have a stalled perspective, which is just what uh, many people commonly use. Although one of the things that I've realized here is that I have projects for the classes that I teach, and sometimes the classes are kind of on autopilot and there's nothing beyond there. So they tend to pop up in there as well from time to time. So uh, I need to have you think about how I'm going to correctly set that up. And then I'm just prompted later on to look at uh, my calendar and then to finally allocate tasks to free blocks. So once I've looked at the forecast perspective, for example, I'll see things that are coming up um, and I'll, I'll try and put some things into free blocks. And some days I've got a lot of those blocks, some days I've not got very many, and in some ways just kind of making your peace with that has been really helpful. It's not, uh, when I was a younger teacher, I used to kind of get stressed because I wasn't doing enough development or I wasn't doing enough, um, uh, you know, professional learning or whatever, but some, in the more classes you get, I suppose you just have to recognize that on a Wednesday, I'm just not getting anything done. You know, if I can just teach my classes and get home in time to pick up the kids, that will be fine. Uh, and that's, I guess, getting older helps with that as well. Uh, I know David Allen has mentioned that in some of his recent stuff. It's just that, you know, getting older helps you just to say no quite a lot. So uh, that's working for me too. So I have a, a, this ritual in the morning and I have a similar one at night, which is not... Um, quite as comprehensive, but uh, what I do there is we have um, battery packs that we give out to kids who forget to charge their iPad at school. So I have a little reminder every day just to charge that pack and to think about any teachers who've told me that they might be off tomorrow or if, if there's something changing tomorrow, uh, just to remind myself to think about that before I leave. And then just look at the calendar for tomorrow. And if I can, I'll get any free blocks for tomorrow. I don't always do that. Sometimes I just leave it for the next day, but uh, sometimes I find it helpful that if I've got a lot of things I need to get done tomorrow, here's where I'm going to do them and, and sort of get that in ahead of time before some panic stations thing hits me first thing in the morning. Yeah. But the fact that I, I tend to try and get in at 7.30 in the morning, that really helps. Not uh, I don't get interrupted for the first sort of 45 minutes of the, of the day because there's only a few other teachers come in at that time. And nobody phones the school at that time because parents don't think anybody's there, which is, is great. Um, so I have the, the beginning of the day and the end of the day as two sort of bookends, if you like. And then I, I do a couple of other things with, with sort of reviewing and maintenance, one of which is the Thursday review, which is, is pretty much your standard GTD weekly review kind of prompts. I try and get that done on a Thursday afternoon when I'm, when I'm quiet at school. Uh, and I just sort of ask myself, what do we want to achieve next week? That's, that's often the main thing. But I try to uh, do things like tidy up my Google Drive as part of the review, thinking thinking about that as another inbox because during the school week, you tend to be throwing together files and just dropping them into that top level. And I don't want to keep it that way. But um, with that unlimited cloud storage, my goodness, you can just gather up a lot of rubbish uh, and uh, prompting yourself to clear that out is helpful as well. And then Friday planning is just what, it, I just ask myself kind of the same question and the same task for every class that I teach. So planning lessons and homework for the next week, checking that all my markings up to date for each one of the classes that I teach. Uh, and that's really helpful just to kind of make sure you leave on a Friday with a clear slate and there's nothing uh, hanging over you for the weekend, if you like. And then I have this quarterly review, uh, and this is something that I've, I, I'm certain I've stolen from somebody, but again, I apologize, I can't remember who, but this is the kind of thing that, this is set to defer once a quarter, so it really doesn't show up in my review or anything until those, that quarter comes, comes back. Um, just asking certain questions like, um, how's my computer setup doing? How's my phone setup doing? Um, how's my schedule working out? Just looking back at that kind of thing. Um, is there anything we can do for teamwork? I find that to be a really uh, useful question because um, I've, I've only been the head of the secondary department at Cedars for about a year now, and I'm really still getting used to management, and, and I'm, I'm good at some bits of it, and I'm really, really bad at some other bits of it, and um, 
help asking myself the question, like think about your team, think about those other people and, and can I get the focus off my workload and my marking and my schedule and, and what can I do to help them is, is a really, really important question for me at this stage. And what I found over the years with GTD is that the kind of questions you have to ask yourself are, they change dramatically over the years. And, and if you get too wound up about this is my GTD system and it can never change, then um, you very quickly find your system being irrelevant to what your actual challenges are. You know, when I was a young parent and, and I had children who were, you know, three and one, I was asking myself different questions than I'm asking myself now when my oldest daughter's 12 and now we've got a three-year-old and, and Beth is in the middle there at age nine and they're all getting into different challenges and, and different things and um, we're doing different activities with them and there's greater commitments and uh, I mean... The, the amount of calendar scheduling that goes on in a family of that size in those ages is just beyond belief. Um, enterprises ran on less 20 years ago, I promise you. Um, so the quarterly review is, is really, really helpful. And then just doing, I have this last thing called review of workflows where that's just anything that I work on, you know, should I still be using Evernote? Should I still be using Google Drive? Should I still be using OmniFocus? Should I still be using, um, you know, all the apps that I use and seeing, has there anything better come out? So I'm trying not to just jump on the newest thing all the time uh, because, you know, life's too busy. But that's not to say there isn't a newer, better thing. Because I think you can often get into that situation where you say, well, I don't want to change anything because it's a waste of time. But in fact, if you did adopt something and, and over the past sort of year and a half, adopting workflow, which we'll talk about in a little minute, has been one of the huge things that has really improved a lot of the things that I do. So uh, it's not always the case that... Uh, new things are not any better than what you've got because not in many cases they often are so i just want to uh, just dive in with a quick question just wondering sure. how long these reviews typically take because i know that's often a concern that uh, with people mm -hmm. is it's gonna reviews are gonna t kind of take over their lives so yeah i i would say that the, the daily review is is something that i'm uh i'm getting pretty good at doing that that's about 20 minutes it's not huge. And the reason is because I do it every day, right? If, if you don't do that review, that review could take you two hours in the morning if you do it once a week. But if you, if you do it as often as I do it, it gets shorter. And that's kind of the thing that I'm also learning about the weekly review is I've never been great at doing a weekly review, but um, I'm starting to understand more about like the, my response to stress and busyness but also the fact that a weekly review is like an instant relief from that. And, and once what I remarked recently on Twitter was that once you understand the weekly review, weekly review is, is like an anti-stress pill. And as soon as you do it, you'll feel better. Um, I now deploy that review much more tactically than I did before. So previously I would kind of be like, well, oh, it's the weekly review. I better wait and do it when the weekly review comes. Whereas now I'm like, well, it's not Sunday night when I normally do it, but I can do it now and, and I'll feel better straight away and get that perspective again. So I'm, I'm starting to understand a lot better how to, how to deploy that tactically when I need it, as well as just in the kind of doctrinaire weekly fashion. The end of school stuff is very quick. Um, it just asks a few questions and, and usually I'll show you some workflows that I used to get some of those questions into the right place anyway. So the, this is almost like a redundant check. The Thursday review takes longer Definitely, that's the, the big one. And what I'm, I'm still working on in my practice is really breaking down the project. And, and one of the things that I've noticed since I moved into more management in the school was that every project begins with project name, look into thing. And that's all I can do. And, and this is something that I've kind of been struggling with in, in the sort of modern management world is that something will come up and the only thing I can do is look into it because I don't know enough about it or it's, it's so new or something like that. And then once I've done that, I've got to find some other mechanism for sort of going from uh, idea to research to notes or analysis and then back to project and project work again. I'm trying to kind of close that circle of something I'm still working on and I don't quite have the exact workflow for that yet, but it's, I'm at least now kind of aware of the need for it and, and it's, it's kind of been new to me since I moved into management because previously I had been dealing with things I understood like computers and networks and things like that. And I knew what I had to do to make the Wi-Fi faster or replace an Apple TV in a classroom or 
back up somebody's iPad. Those were all checklists, and I had that kind of an autopilot, whereas now it's more uh, novel things that come along, and that's, that's the interesting challenge. The quarterly review is, is huge, and it will take as much time as I, as I can possibly give it. Um, and how deeply do I want to ask those questions? You know, um, some quarters I, I do that in quite a light fashion. Other quarters I really dig into, um, particularly around about the new year. I mean, the next one you can see there is deferred till 5th of January. So um, hopefully I'll be relaxing somewhere at that point, not at school, and uh, uh, try and think about that one quite deeply as well. Would you do that all in one sitting, or would you do it over some days? Sometimes. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just depends. And maybe it, you can see it's broken up into sections here. So maybe one of them I'll think about quite quickly. Like, you know, I'm, I know I'm happy with my iOS setup right now, so I'll just, I'll just take that chunk and say I'm, I'm good with that. I really want to think about what we can do for the team in the, in the next quarter or something like that. So the, the, the question about the team might be something I would look at much more deeply in the summer when we can put in place new structures for the school year coming up, whereas other ones might just be adjusted as, as need be. Um, I'll, I'll just show you a couple of other things really briefly. I, um, I have a very basic project set up here where I, what I've, I sort of, I'm sort of doing this, you know, trying to look at this as areas of responsibility, but all I have here is, uh, and I'll zoom in on this a little bit uh, so you can see it. I've got um, uh, GTD maintenance is one folder, school is a folder, podcast is a folder, personal and productivity is sort of something that I could probably merge into GTD maintenance if I, if I took the time to do it. That may happen in the next quarterly review, you never know. So I, I try and keep those very organized, but if I go into school for a moment, you'll see that in school, I've got a range of different reports uh, or different areas of responsibility in here. And this is actually, this has been much more easy to structure than, uh, for example, the personal stuff, which is a little bit more kind of, uh, unstructured but I've got responsibilities in course development which that was a huge folder two years ago where I was doing a lot of work to do um, what is sometimes described as deep work if any of you know Carl Newport's blog and his, his books about deep work um, one of the things I really realized uh, a couple of years ago was that the deep work for a teacher isn't actually in the classroom it's in the design of the curriculum and it's in the design of the course and when I, when I finally understood that, like eight years into my career as a teacher, um, I, I spent a huge amount of time working on, uh, working on the design of my projects and, and the design of my curriculum. And once I had that done, um, I, I actually unlocked a ton of productivity in school because I wasn't every day like, deciding what I was going to do the next day. Um, maybe it's just planning, I don't know, but I think that there's something, there's a bit of learning that's a bit deeper than just planning the week but it's making sure that the course itself is coherent um, and and designed for the long term so course development has has dropped down over the course of time other bits of school development are things like um let me see what i've got in here uh looking at security arrangements for the school um there's coming up a, a refresh of the technologies curriculum in scotland so that's something i'm tracking here for example uh, professional development courses both for me and also other ones that I want to give to other teachers and so on. I've still got my IT uh, responsibilities so we've got things in here uh, sorry that's the wrong one um, things like managing the school website managing our device management server general IT problems all jumping up in here bugs on various iOS apps and things like that. Um, we've got operational tasks things like scheduling the minibus which is one of my joyful tasks I'm desperate to write a workflow that will solve that problem, but I haven't got there yet. Um, staff absences is a big one. We'll talk, I'll show you this a little minute um, because um, I have a workflow that helps me build this. So just to give you an idea of what's in here is that whenever a teacher tells me they need to be off school for something, for example, one of my teachers here is going to be on jury duty in a couple of weeks time. Um, I have a workflow that I just run from the today view, uh, from the widget view in iOS. And it just asks me who's going to be off and when are they going to be off. And you can see there's a little kind of four item checklist structure there where I look, I write the timetable cover, I um, check the playground duties for that teacher, and I print the sheet that goes on the wall to tell the pupils where to go for those classes. Uh, and it's just, I just want to make sure I don't forget any of those three things. And I have a workflow that builds that for me. So in a little minute, we'll talk about how that workflow works. Um, Got some other jobs and things here. Uh, 
communications is just if I need to send emails to staff or parents or any part of the parent community, that all lives in there as well. We've got pastoral stuff in there. People, if I have to follow up with people or something like that, I can do that. Um, various other things. I've got my, you mentioned my iPads for India project. This is my last thing is to check when they actually get delivered. And once I can tick that off, that whole project is done as well. So uh, that's my kind of school work there. Um, in podcasts, just reminders uh, to do little bits and pieces that I'm supposed to do for those podcasts. When we started Canvas, I was learning, again, this is another example of how the questions change as, as time goes by. I had like 25 things in that Canvas project because I was learning you have to do this in the CMS and then you have to do this and then you have to do that. And now I know all of those things and they're all automatic. So all I need to do is just have produce show and that's when the next one's going to be. So that's good. Uh, personal is much more just random projects. Uh, I'll show you this project and then I, later on I'm going to show you the, uh, the automation that went in behind this. But this is, a, um, this is a, a project that we were doing at my church, which was about reading the whole Bible in a year. Uh, and it comes from a website called The Bible Project. And what they have is they have both videos and readings for every day. So what I have is I have a, a 365 plus item project, each item of which uh, repeats on a yearly, individual yearly basis. So you can see here, um, oops, for example, this one here, um, it's deferred until uh, the, the 7th of March 2017, and it repeats every 12 months. And every single item there has a custom repeat date, and every single item in there also has a custom note, which has uh, URLs directly to a Bible reading website where uh, you, can, you can see that verse and read that verse. So this is about the only way that I ever managed to kind of keep up with this for any amount of time was to, <laughs> to really die, put it right into my, uh, into my OmniFocus process. Uh, and, I'll, and later on, I'll show you how I did that in terms of OmniFocus automation as well. Various other things going in here. I've got my OmniFocus Live project. Um, I have actually written the outline for that, so I can tick that off while we're here. <laughs> and we are literally doing it right now. So, so that's kind of just important to give you an idea of my, of my kind of OmniFocus structure. Um, and even in here, like with, uh, we've got a series of rugby matches we're going to. Uh, my daughter and I got season tickets for the Scotland rugby team for our birthdays this year. So this is another thing where we've kind of got a little template that we just create over and over again for the different uh, the different games and so on that we're going to as well. So that's some of the things that uh, that I do with OmniFocus. And my, my perspective setup is, is pretty basic. I have um, a view for school, which is just uh, sorted by due date and what are the, the next available actions in all these projects. And I have the same thing for home. And really where, where I get with that is um, when it comes to context, I think I finally cracked the problem of work is available everywhere, at least for me, which is that I only have two contexts, well, three if you count errands as well, and that's a geofenced context. But really what's, key, what's been key for me in making this work is that there are only two contexts. One, am I working for the school or am I working for myself at this point? And um, if I want to do schoolwork, I can hit the school button and I see whatever is most important for school. And if I, hit, if I don't want to be doing school stuff, I can see what's most important for me. And one of the reasons for that is because I, I, the school I work in is quite a small school. And like I've said before, I kind of wear a lot of hats and every teacher does in that kind of situation. What I find is that um, school creeps into home quite a lot more than it would for teachers maybe in a big school. But also home creeps into school as well. And um, switching between those two contexts, even during the school day, which many teachers wouldn't do. You know, a lot of teachers in a big school, they sort of, um, they cut themselves off from their own responsibilities and they're just at school and they're teaching classes. But for me, those boundaries are just a lot more fluid. And particularly the more you get into management, the more time comes and goes and, and so on. So uh, that's actually working really well for me just to say, is this a school thing or is this a home thing? And whatever mode I'm in at the moment, is where I want to jump to. So, so that's been really helpful in, in terms of uh, sort of getting a grip on context because for years that was just a completely unused part of OmniFocus for me because I think it's, it's one of the common criticisms of the book uh, is that context don't 
those constraints have really gone for knowledge workers because uh, work follows you everywhere and everything is possible everywhere. The only thing that genuinely works at home is cut the grass uh, and everything else can be done pretty much anywhere. So, so that's really helped me a lot. I just wanted to mention that because it's, it's made a big change in, in how I kind of view my, my OmniFocus setup and so on. Uh, and this Q1 uh, project here, this is just the one that some people call today or latest and loudest. Um, uh, Q1 just comes from that idea of the important urgent matrix. And this is just stuff that is due right now or flagged. And it's, it's kind of my panic stations uh, place to go if things are going, uh, going a little bit haywire. So with all of that, let's get into workflow. And I want to show you some of the, uh, the stuff that I do in Workflow. So if you're not familiar with Workflow, what it is is it's a, it's a programming application for iOS that lets you um, write essentially little scripts by dragging together blocks of actions. And then those scripts can interact with other apps on iOS using what are called URL schemes. So you know a URL is HTTP colon double slash www.apple.com or whatever. Well, other URL schemes can be things like OmniFocus colon slash slash, and that will launch OmniFocus to do something, or many other apps in the system can do this as well. Uh, and what I've been doing recently is I've been building up more and more workflows where um, I use workflow to gather information from somewhere, usually from what I type in, but sometimes from other sources, and um, basically uh, template out an OmniFocus project for me and then send it straight into OmniFocus. So I'll show you the staff cover one first. And uh, this, is the, this is the workflow screen. And on the left under suggested is, uh, these are all the actions that workflow would suggest that I maybe put into this project next. And on the right hand side under the play button and the dark blue bar is, this is my script, okay? So I'll talk you through this example because it's quite short and it'll help you see some of the other things that we're going to do. Um, the first step is uh, this ask for input box here. And what this does is it just prompts me to type in some text. And it's asking me, remember this is the workflow for when a staff member's off, it sets up that four item template for me uh, or sub project really inside the staff absence project. It asks me who is the staff member and I'll save that in a variable called staff. And then I ask for the date of their absence. And you'll see here that in this input type box here, um, you can ask for certain kinds of information. So what this does is it gives me the rolling date picker in iOS. I'll run this workflow in a second and you'll see how that works. But it lets me just spin the dials to get a specific date. And then what I do is I format that in the way that OmniFocus likes, which is the ISO 8601 date format, which is year dash month dash day. And I save that in a variable. And then this is kind of where the magic happens. And I'll zoom in on this a little bit. And this is, uh, let me just pull it over. So what you're seeing here is this is task paper text. And it's um, the blue lozenges are, those are the variables that I've already created in the workflow. So I've got a variable called staff, which is the name of the, of the staff member. And the absence is the date that the staff member is going to be off. So the first line here, cover for staff. Sorry, tapped on it by mistake. Um, cover for staff on absence. And then at due is, that's in, on the, in task paper parlance, that's the due date for that project. So what I'm doing there is I'm saying this project is due on the date of the absence one day previously at 3 p.m. Okay, so this all becomes due the day before the person's going to be off. Um, I might actually change that to be two days because that would give me a little more time to get things wrong and then fix it. But uh, the, this is one of the nice tricks in OmniFocus scripting is that you can use um, dates relative to something else. So I have another project I'm working on where I have things all stepped back multiple weeks prior to the due date. And I'll show you that as well. But that's a useful trick is it's, it's the day of the absence minus one day at three o'clock on that day. And then inside that I've got these, um, oh, sorry, also auto done is that's the value of, you know, complete this project when the last item is completed. Um, this is the only way you can set this in iOS. You, there's no UI in the iOS version of OmniFocus to set this flag, but you can set it if you are scripting OmniFocus at the time. Now these in, indented items with dashes here, these are the other tasks, okay? So write cover for staff name on this date, check their playground duties on this date, 
and finally print the cover sheet. So it's not very complicated, and these sub items inherit their due date properties from the from the parent item as well. So then what I do is you do this thing called URL encoding where you just make it possible for uh, workflow to send that information to OmniFocus. And then here, this is my last task, which is um, to create the OmniFocus URL, okay? So OmniFocus colon triple slash paste, and what that does is it just essentially pastes and it effectively copies what you've taken, uh, what you've written in the workflow pastes it into OmniFocus. And if you're familiar with the web at all, you'll, you'll recognize the question mark and keyword equals value. Target equals slash task slash staff absence. Uh, that's the project name that these tasks will go into. So it's, po it's possible actually to target um, the, this template directly into uh, a work, uh, an OmniFocus project somewhere in, in your database. Okay? And then content equals input. So that's just all the stuff that I've templated up here. Send all of that and paste it into uh, staff absences project. Okay. So if I run this, you'll see exactly what this looks like. If I hit play, okay, it asks me who the staff member is, and I'll say uh, Bob, and hit OK. And then it asks me what the date of absence is going to be. So I'll say uh, they're going to be gone on the twentieth of December, twenty sixteen, and I'll hit OK, and that's it. That's all I do, okay? And you'll see that now we've gone into OmniFocus, we've gone into the staff absences project, and you see down here at the very last four items here, I've got um, right cover for Bob on 2016-12-20, check playground duties, um, and over here, that's all due on the 19th of December because the absence date was the 20th, and now minus one day makes this due on the 19th as well. So, uh, I set them to be parallel tasks, uh, sorry, sequential tasks. You can actually uh, specify parallel tasks as well. It's just another uh, property in, in OmniFocus scripting. But that's, that's the project that I get. And that's been hugely helpful because um, in the very first version of OmniFocus automation, it wasn't possible to target things straight into an existing project, but it is now. And that's hugely helpful because what I can now do is I can, if somebody's you know, running past me in the corridor, they're going, oh, by the way, I'm not going to be here on Friday. I can quickly go, okay, that person, that date, okay, fire it and forget it. And at least I know that I've captured and it's, it's, it's an extension of that trusted system idea. And, and that's, been, uh, that's been really, really helpful to do that kind of thing. Any questions on, on that basic idea of, of workflow and only focus together? Are you happy with that? Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, yeah, and I didn't realize it was actually possible to insert into an existing project. So that's a, that's yeah. a great takeaway right there. Now, that also works. Um, you know how in OmniFocus you can do, like if, you're, um, if you're setting something with a project and you can do a, a, a kind of search for, right? So if I go you know, DR and get daily review as my first item, you can actually put in there a short, a short segment of text rather than specifying the full name of the project. You can, I could just say you know, slash, D, slash task slash DR and it will apply that searching algorithm and it will pick the top item and put it into that as well. So if you have a uniquely named project, you can actually make it even, even simpler than that again. Uh, that would be helpful, for example, in workflow if you were wanting to prompt the user for uh, the project that these tasks have to go into. You could just say, you know, put in your autocomplete suggestion and fire it into that project as well. So that's, that's also pretty helpful. And if you were creating a new uh, new workflow, would you typically would you have kind of a template workflow you would start with, or would you tend to build it from scratch? I have I haven't done that yet because um, as you'll see, the, the workflows tend to be a little different depending on what it is we're doing. But quite often they start out like this: ask for some input, save it in a variable; ask for more input, save it in a variable, and then substitute them into some boilerplate. So this is what we tend to end up with: is a text block with a lot of these little blue lozenges in it where these are all the things that I've either computed or asked the user for all the way down the script and saved them in variables. And then I just sort of plug them all into the correct place in, inside, the, uh, inside the workflow. Cool. And I know a few people are looking at this and, and feeling a bit of technical overwhelm, but uh, I think if you 
were to actually play with this yourself, you might find it's actually not as complicated as it might look at first glance. Um, and certainly having some sample ones to start with and just starting very simply can uh, make a big difference. Yep, I can, I can show you one that's perhaps even simpler, which is this one called New Pupil iPad. And what this is, is um, if a new pupil starts the school, I have a number of things I have to do in, in various systems to set it up so that their iPad as part of our program will work. So what I do here is, I, again, I start with ask for input and I ask what, what day is this pupil going to start? And I put in ask for the date. And uh, what I then do is I subtract one day from this, okay? So I'm doing this slightly differently. You saw me previously do it in, Omni, in OmniFocus where I said minus one D, but here I'm actually using a workflow step to subtract the day from the date that's been put in. And then I just format it in the way that OmniFocus likes and I save it in the start date. That's a variable called start date. And then down below, I have another um, text block where I have a small template, okay? And all I do is I say, set up new pupil iPad, it's flagged because I want to work on it straight away and it's due on the day they're going to start school, okay? But remember, I've, I've already subtracted one day from that date, so I'm kind of cheating a little bit here. Uh, and it's, it, these are just, there's nothing even complicated about this. These are all just individual tasks that have to be done, such as um, checking the spelling of the pupil's name and checking their class and generating a password for them and so on, uh, generating their email address. These are just all the things that I have to do when a new pupil starts. Um, and these are all just individual tasks. I'm not even substituting any variables into that. That's just cut and paste, but putting the pupil's name and a due date into the overall project that we're working on there. And this is a slightly newer workflow, which I wrote after the add task paper to OmniFocus feature was added to workflow. So workflow now actually has a, a, a simplified block. For what you saw that was quite complicated at the bottom where there was a URL scheme that um, I had sort of hand manipulated, there's now an action called add task paper to OmniFocus, with the option for add to inbox or add to projects. So what this one will do is this will actually generate a new project the previous one was a little more advanced because what it did was it generated a sub-project that went into an existing project, whereas this one, this is a project that I'm quite happy to just have an individual project for now, and then once I'm done with it, the project can finish. Whereas the staff absences project essentially never finishes. It's, it's one of those areas that just constantly needs to get managed. So hopefully that's maybe a little a simpler one. Maybe we should have started with that one, but it's just... This is where I kind of keep my boilerplates for OmniFocus is inside workflows. And just to mention as well, the previous webinar is called Automating OmniFocus on iOS. And I did go through some very simple examples there, including the one that uses the task paper to OmniFocus. And I covered what task paper is. So if that's still not crystal clear, you might want to go back and uh, just give that one a, a watch. Okay. And also, if I can just say that in, on Canvas, my podcast, uh, for the last couple of episodes and the next couple of episodes, we're doing a whole series on programming with workflow. So if you want to learn more about the basics of workflow and what are variables and what can you do with these blocks, uh, you might want to subscribe to Canvas and have a look at the last two shows and the next two or three shows after this. Uh, I'm just going through that as well too. It's uh, yeah, been really helpful to fill in some gaps. And yep. Um, I'll show you a couple of other things. Um, uh, this is one I've been working on. This isn't completely finished yet, but this is um, uh, a template for putting in a project about uh, dealing with parents' night. So parents' night actually has a, a very long runway before the evening where all the parents come. So we have to ask questions like, which year groups are coming to this parents' evening? When is parents' night? Saving that as a date. And then here what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put together a set of... Um, OmniFocus statements where I'm working backwards, you can see here at the end, um, I'm deferring and during multiple weeks prior to the day, things that have to happen you know, step by step by step. Um, and hopefully this is a, a workflow that I'll maybe only run once or twice a year once we decide when the parents' nights are going to be. Then it'll give me, it'll push back, you know, five or six weeks prior to the event, all the things that need to pop up. And this, again, this is just more about trusted system and checklists as well. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the book, The Checklist Manifesto, 
which was uh, was kind of influential on me. And, and since I read that book, a lot of the that's where a lot of these workflows came from. Is essentially trying to make templatable checklists I can use for big parts of my job. Uh, and that's one. This one's still to be perfected, but it's uh, it's coming along. And uh, hopefully, we'll use that for next year's prints night as well. Yeah, another vote for checklist manifesto. It's a fabulous book. It's actually quite a page turner. It, I thought it was going to be quite a, a dry topic, but it was a, yeah, just a fascinating book to read. Yep, I'll show you one last one, just as, as yet another example of a similar pr principle. Oops, I accidentally ran that one. And just to note that if you double tap on any of these in this view, um, the, the workflow will actually run automatically for you. So this is one that I use to, uh, if I set a homework assignment, I can just quickly on my phone uh, put in a couple of follow-up actions. So uh, I ask for what's the homework title. I ask for the, um, the by default, the due date here is the day after I, I run the workflow, but I can also adjust that if I want to. Um, and then what I have here is I have a, a list of all the classes that I teach and I have an OmniFocus project for each one of these with the same name as what you see in this list here. So primary seven computing, S1 computing and so on. And then I just pick from that list, which class am I looking at right now? And I save that. And then what I do is, as you can see, um, similar final item here, where it's called collect homework assignment name of assignment from class, uh, defer and uh, make that due on the due date, defer it until just before that, because essentially what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for uh, a task that will come up that says, oh, just remember to collect this today. And then finally, I've got a task that says market, which is a day after. So I'm using uh, day of and certain times like that. And then later I'm using plus one day. You see me use minus one to put things before the date they're due. But um, this is, you know, the day after this happens, I have to then have a task to remind me to mark it as well. So, so that's the kind of thing I'm working on there for that as well. And that's a slightly older project that hasn't finished because that uses the uh, OmniFocus URL that I'm making by hand rather than, uh, rather than sending it with the built-in action. And I'll show you the reason why I'm doing that is because, can you see there where it says uh, target equals task slash class? What I'm doing is from that section where I choose the name of the class that I'm working on, this is going to target different projects in my OmniFocus database depending on which class I'm dealing with. So if I have a, a homework assignment for primary seven computing, this will go into the primary seven project or the S1 project or the S2 project. And the idea here is that what I want at the end of all these workflows is I want fire and forget into OmniFocus. So I don't want to have to then go into OmniFocus and then find the right project and then paste it manually. I want to target the correct project every time. So that's why I'm, I'm doing that by hand and then launching it directly from workflow. Uh, that's a, something that's still a, work, a bit of a work in progress as well. I'm saying that quite a lot, I mean, <laughs> uh, Workflows are never finished, that's the... That's I think life is a work in progress, really, when it comes right Yes, I guess so, yeah. I guess so. Yeah, I promise you, Tim, just as, as the final thing I wanted to show you, um, if I can zoom back here to Google Docs, uh, that Bible reading project, um, this is the raw OmniFocus project that that's created from, okay? Um, and if I can just scroll this, uh, to give you an idea of how rich it is. Um, here we go. Uh, these, these are all, what I did here actually, just to give people an idea of what actually happened with this was, um, sorry, I managed to hit control center there as well. What I did for this was I, um, I actually wrote a Python script that would generate each one of these tasks. So every line that begins with a dash here, that's an additional task. But then you can actually specify things in here like uh, what day is it due? And, and you'll see that I don't have a year in those days because OmniFocus very intelligently, uh, if when you paste in this whole block, it works out where you are in the year and it will, it will consider the, just the last few days to be this year and then everything else will be wrapped around to next year. So it's really, really smart in that respect. And what that means is every January, I can paste this back into OmniFocus or whatever, or if I ever have to recreate it in another database, I can do that. Um, we're using repeat method, which is fixed repeat times, not defer again after or due again after. And here, 
what I'm doing is I'm specifying a repeat rule. And this is the kind of thing you can, this is a very detailed thing that the only way to really learn this properly is to set it up on the Mac version and do copy as task paper. But what I'm saying is that it repeats monthly with an interval of 12 months. So that means repeat every 12 months, basically. And that's just the way that you'd express that in, in the syntax that OmniFocus wants. And then here, just down below, I've got that, those are notes. So the lines that are indented below the task, those, are, those go into the notes field. They don't go into the task itself. So those are the URLs that I use to, to then go ahead and see that. So, so that's how that works. And that is, that was the first thing I ever did with OmniFocus for scripting, believe it or not, uh, and by far the most complex thing. Um, but I was trying to do it before and the day after I started working on this, um, OmniFocus came out with the, this automation technique. So uh, it was a big and early win and it made me incredibly enthusiastic for uh, doing a lot more with uh, OmniFocus uh, and automation. So yeah, that's... Yeah. Uh, that's my kind of workflow uh, scenario, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, Fraser. And my understanding is you do all of this through the workflow app rather than using editorial with the, uh, the, the script edition. Yes, uh, the, the Bible project one I actually did with a Python script. Um, all of those, I actually wrote a script to generate the script to then script OmniFocus. But for the, the more basic things that you've seen here, yeah, I, I would um, start and finish just in workflow here rather than uh, editorial as such. Yeah. And another suggestion too, for people who are just getting into this, uh, it might make sense to use editorial, write the task paper, and then just run a script. And if you wanna keep things really simple to start with, it doesn't give you as much flexibility in terms of being prompted for specific date formats and things like that. But uh, yeah, that might be a, kind of a gentle introduction to it is, and then moving to workflow from there. Yep. If you copy projects in OmniFocus, you can actually, uh, you can get the task paper version of a fully configured OmniFocus project and paste it into any text editor um, and just inspect what OmniFocus would do in that situation and then try and emulate it that way as well. That's, that was how I figured out how to do all those repeat rules was I just set up one task that repeated the way I wanted to and then copied it as task paper and then sort of started to pull it apart from there. Would you mind taking a moment just to show that? Uh just with a sample project, oh, the, the copy and pasting and what that looks like yeah. um, in action. <laughs> now you're asking. I'm yeah. not absolutely certain that you can do this on iOS, but I will try okay. it. I know you can do it on the Mac for sure. You, but, yeah. you can certainly do it on the Mac. There's an yeah. edit copy as task paper menu mm -hmm. item. But um, let me think. The way you do it is you go into the project view and you tap on the share button and then you tap copy. And so if I was to now go into, say, uh, editorial or just to prove that other text editors are available, um, if I go into one writer and create a new document, um, I should be able to paste in there. Yep, there we okay. go. Yes. So, so there you go. Yeah. So that's that whole project that I just had. Um, in fact, it's all kinds of stuff, um, including the URL of the project. Uh, the OmniFocus task there. So you see there, there's a URL that begins OmniFocus slash task slash, and then a, a, a meaningless ID number. You can actually use that information in a script as well to target that specific project as well. If you don't want to specify the exact name, you can use that URL as well. Okay. So and if the that, name of the project changes, I assume it'll still work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so you can see there that I've got the whole overall staff absences project as a parallel project. It has the school context in it as well. So that's how you would specify context for a project that you're creating is you just put at context brackets school. And that's, uh, those are the kind of things. And do you typically put context on everything uh, just in general or do you just right. sort of select? Yeah, I'm getting more into the habit of doing that, particularly for things like this, which are kind of, now I'm in more of a management role, those projects that will never finish, uh, they all have a context on them because they constantly get new tasks put into them. For example, this one in particular is a, is a big one that I use a lot. Um, other things, not so much. And I kind of have it both ways because I have quite a simple folder structure where I just have home and school folders. And then I also have the context essentially mirroring the folder structure. So it's just two ways to look at more or less the same thing. I imagine at least a few people from the Omni group will be 
watching this uh, recording. I'm curious what are some things that you'd like to see in a future version? What are maybe uh, a few key sort of wish list items for the iOS app specifically? Yeah, I, I suppose one one of the things that I really would love, and I know there's a kind of roundabout way to do it through the Reminders app, but you know, Siri integration would be wonderful, and that's not um, that's not within Omni's gift to do. I'm afraid that's we're waiting on Apple to do that one, but that's that's a really really nice one. Um, I think to be honest with you, so much of of what Omni do with iOS are, is so incredibly beyond what most companies are doing that there's there's not a really an obvious uh, thing for me that this is a real missing thing. I suppose the one thing that we've, we've sometimes talked about, and I mentioned it earlier in the show, is that um, bulk operations are, are difficult on iOS in general. So for example, here, or if I go into um, the forecast view, for example, one of the nice things you can do in forecast on the Mac is you can, you can drag a task from the task list into another day schedule it that way being able to do some things like that on ios i think it would be helpful or just to be able to select like 20 tasks and give them all a different context or something like that whereas right now if i edit this what i can do is i can delete the tasks but unlike in mail where mail's got the little checkbox where you can multiple select and then archive a lot of emails at once omnifocus doesn't have that on ios so being able to select those tasks and then do something else with them I think that's probably the next level for for OmniFocus is just to be able to do those kind of bulk operations that you can do very easily on the Mac version, uh, also in the iOS version. But it, it's so complete that you know that's that's the kind of esoteric thing that I'm talking about is uh, a very niche sort of workflow thing there. And I will be making a recording of this available too, so uh, this might be one you need to watch a few times, especially for the workflow section, just to uh, to understand how they work and. And um, I think uh, you mentioned earlier, it's, you, you can provide a few of these workflows as, for people to play with, even though it's not going to match their exact situation. Um, I know when I was first learning programming, I would just take some sample code and, and make some changes and even just something as simple as changing the name of the prompt and just seeing what happened and, and just kind of getting used to it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And again, if, if you want to listen to some of the episodes of Canvas, you'll find that I think that will maybe clarify some of the things about workflow and, and the basics of workflow. And then just, I suppose for me, I want to say is have a look at workflow and then be aware that you can use this to do some cool stuff with OmniFocus once you've kind of got a grip of how workflow works in general. Uh, that's That would be a good way to come at that, I think. Yeah, it really helps to have that foundation in, in workflow in general, too. Yeah. And once you understand how to use it with OmniFocus, you can use it with all kinds of different apps on your iOS device. It's not yeah. not even limited to OmniFocus, or you could even have a workflow that uh, does something in OmniFocus as well as doing something in another app. Mm -hmm. but really, the, the sky is the limit with all of this. Absolutely. Yeah. I think one point you made that was uh, very valid is not to... Uh, uh, I think you've got your system carefully designed so you're not fiddling constantly. You've kind of got a part of your routine, but not not something you kind of do on a whim so much. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a kind of concept of disciplined fiddling that I think is important, where uh, some of the things that you know I've done here, they all came from just fiddling about. And if I, if I never allow myself to fiddle with anything, I don't make the enhancements that I've made uh, with some of this stuff. So there's a kind of discipline to that as well. That's discipline fiddling, I like that too. Discipline fiddling, yeah. That's <laughs> a trademark, you can, you can license that one. <laughs> uh, there's one question from Dean on what uh, role flags play in your system. Um, I, I think really and truly what flags mean is I'm really freaked out by this project and I really don't want to forget it. Um, I, I think that's the thing that... Um, over the years of having done GTD, uh, I'm, I'm still a little paranoid that things get lost in the system. And flaggings for me is sort of a way to say this actually matters somehow more than other projects, or I, I care about this. But having said that, I've got things that are have been flagged for months and months and haven't been done. So it's not, it's not as effective as perhaps it could be. Um, but I think better reviewing, actually, I probably wouldn't really need to use flags that much. But due dates tend to tend to be a bigger thing for me because of the kind of structured rhythm of a school term or a school year. A lot of things are driven by this is happening on this day or this class happens on these days. 
Um, so I think for a teacher, maybe the calendar is actually perhaps more important because like I said at the beginning, you don't have a lot of optionality in what you do on a particular day. So if I've got a thing I need to read for the next class, it has to be done by the time that class comes in again. So due dates are actually quite an effective way of working for a teacher, I think. So when you use a due date, is that implied that it's a hard deadline, like there's a consequence to not having it complete by then? Is that Usually, yes. You know, so for example, if a pupil starts a school and there's no iPad there for them to use, that's going to be a, a poor situation for the pupil. For the teachers that they will see that day as well, they'll all be unhappy with me as well. And the parents who have just signed on to come to the school, um, they're not going to be getting a very good first impression. So the, the due dates you know, are, are, are very much a driver of a lot of life in school. Okay. Well, uh, let's, let's wrap it up uh, there. And I want to say uh, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks again, Fraser. Really appreciate you taking the time to, to share all of this with you uh, with all of us. And I've certainly learned some new things myself. I'm definitely, uh, definitely feeling excited to up my, my workflow game, especially and it's uh, an app I have been using, but uh, yeah, every time I see a demonstration of what's possible with it, uh, you know, I just get more, more motivated to, uh, to, to find some new uh, new things to use it for. So, so thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, I'll include uh, references to anything that Fraser mentioned in the notes that accompany this video. Um, so if you want to check out all of his websites and definitely uh, subscribe to, uh, to Canvas, I think uh, you'll find that. So if you just want to be more productive on your iPad, that's definitely one of the best places to go on the internet right now. And, and also getting, uh, getting some great input from uh, Federico Batici as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again. And thanks everyone who is here today and everyone who's listening in and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Thank you. Yep.